Have your Bibles open up to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, starting in verse 14. We'll wrap up this chapter this morning. As you're turning there, uh, you ever listen to people pray? When somebody else is praying in the room or something like that, it's always an, it's always an interesting experience, right? There are, we, we can admit it together here this morning, right? That there are some quirks about the way we pray, right? Like, it, it strikes me as odd that unless somebody's being very intentional, we almost all begin the prayer with, God, we thank you for today, right? That's the, like, hello, and, and then we move into the content of the prayer from there. And, of course, we all wrap up every prayer the same way in Jesus' name, amen. It's all one word, right? Um, very quick. We used to say some other things, too. We used to say, through Christ our Lord, for Christ's sake, something like that. But we've settled into this one very short phrase at this point. Uh, one of my favorite ones, of course, is the fact that we tend to use the Lord's name like punctuation, right? So anytime you've got a comma, you need to say God or Lord or something like that. That's just a, a big part of, of how we pray, too. I'm always fascinated, too, by the, the differences in how people pray. Uh, so I was in youth ministry for years and uh, frequently meant going out for meals because if you don't feed them, they don't come. So this was just, this is the heart of youth ministry right there. So uh, so to be going out with meal, for meals with people, and I, I had some meals back-to-back sometimes, you know, Wednesday night, Thursday night, something like that, and I always make the kid pray for the meal. I figure this is a good, you know, first step they can take. And so I got one night, um, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. Not strictly speaking a prayer, since you're talking about God, not to God, but okay, fine, you know, we heard this one before. Next night, out with a, a, a very good friend. I mean, like, these are the best friends, basically, these two kids that I was meeting with. Very next night, ask this guy to pray for the food instead, and he says, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we're about to receive from thy bounty. Right, so, good friends, really different prayers, right? Both memorized, no, nobody's praying uh, off the cuff or whatnot. But it just got me thinking at that point, so, so what was the difference <laughs> that, that these prayers could be so different? I'm thinking it's pretty obvious, right? I mean, how do we learn to pray? How, how do we learn uh, to say something like this before a meal? We learn by listening to other people pray, right? I mean, how, how did these two end up with such different prayers before a meal? It's because that's what they heard in their home growing up, right? We, we learn by listening to other people pray which is fine, right? We've got to learn somehow. It's how we learn to talk in the first place. Why not how we learn how to talk to God? Uh, it's fine so long as the prayers we're learning are good. But if they're wanting a little bit, if there's, if there's something lacking in it, well, then what do we do? What if we, what if we want to grow in our prayer and just move beyond what it is that we heard all these years into something a little bit deeper? What do we do then? And here we get an opportunity, and where we are in the Ephesians this morning, uh, we can listen to Paul's prayers, right? We can listen to the prayers of Scripture, see how these men and women prayed, and, and, and start to go, okay, maybe I could, I could pull some of this out, right? So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to listen in to Paul's prayers, uh, begin to see how we can pray Scripture. And it reminds us, as long as we're in this series on an identity crisis, right, figuring out who we are in Christ, figuring out who we are when we find our identity in him, when we let him be the ground of our identity, we see that one of the key pieces of all this, of course, is that if we're going to be, uh, have our identity in Christ, it means we're going to have a praying identity. Right? We're going to be a prayerful people for sure. And so that's what we're talking about this morning main idea, the main takeaway that I want us to have as we look at our praying identity is this, pray for what matters most to God. Okay, pray for what matters most to God. And we're going to look at three things, praying for reasons that matter to God, praying for requests that matter to God, and praying for results that matter to God. Uh, that'll be our outline this morning. Now, uh, just a, uh, a, a, a warning, I guess. I'm going to spend the bulk of my time on point two, okay? on the requests that matter to God. So don't get excited when I whip through point one and think you're getting out of here early. You're not. That doesn't happen, all right? But don't get discouraged when it feels like point three is never going to come and you're going to be here through dinner. That won't happen either, okay? So uh, with that in mind, let's look first of all at praying for reasons that matter to God. Let me read the first bit there, uh, Ephesians 3, verses 14 and 15. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So this is Paul. hasn't even started praying yet, but just letting him know this is the reason. This is the reason I go to God in prayer. And what reason is it? Why does he get down on his knees? Well, it's because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Now, we know this because when you get something like for this reason in the Bible, you want to kind of look at what comes right before it, typically. 
for, for this reason. Well, what's the this? It's, it's whatever just happened. Not true here, because, uh, so Shane preached last week, right? Uh, Ephesians 3, 1 to 13. You'll notice that uh, whereas we would normally look at maybe verses 12 and 13, if you look all the way back up at chapter 3, verse 1, it starts the exact same way as our passage, right? For this reason, I, Paul, and you can hear him saying, right? I kneel before the Father, except he interrupts himself. I know what your translation looks like. Mine has got a dash, right? Like he doesn't finish the sentence and then he, he dives in uh, at this point. Uh, so we want to go even further back, right? We want to go to what happens right before that. What is it uh, right before Paul gets uh, going? It's the end of Ephesians 2 in particular. Here's verses 21 and 22. In him, the whole building, and by the whole building, we've been talking about this the last few weeks, right? It means Jews and Gentiles. People who come from religious backgrounds, people who come from irreligious backgrounds, right? Everybody being brought together in one building. In him, the whole building is joined together, rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. So what is it that God is doing? He's creating a new humanity who are spiritually mature, spiritually mature, right? A, a holy temple in the Lord. So the, all these bricks in the temple got to be got to be made holy, right? And so Paul prays that 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 would happen, right? That's what he's doing. He's saying, all right, I, I, I want to pray that this actually uh, takes place. He prays for what he knows is God's will, all right? So God is saying, this is what I want to do. And Paul says, well, then I better pray for it. And that's maybe not the way we think of prayer always, right? We tend to think of prayer as almost changing God's mind. Like, I've got to convince him to do this. That's not the way the writers of Scripture typically see it. Now, I'll give you a great example. Daniel, right, in the Old Testament, he's uh, exiled to, to Babylon, right? And he's reading the prophet Jeremiah. And the prophet Jeremiah says, this is God's plan, right? I'm, I'm going to send you off to exile for 70 years, and then I'm going to bring you back. And Daniel reads this, and he looks at his watch, and he goes, the 70 years are almost up. I better start praying. And you go, well, that's weird. God promised to do this, so why do you have to pray? But that's not the way Daniel took it at all. He said, no, 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 that, that means I have to. I know God wants to do this, so I better pray for it. It's almost like Daniel sees he may be God's chosen means to God's chosen ends. And of course, that should make a lot of sense to us because the, the one prayer we probably all have at least heard at some point in our lives from Scripture is the one Jesus taught us, right? Our Father in heaven, that one. And what does he say? May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? So what's your will? That's what I want to see accomplished. And that's how Paul is praying here too. I know what you want to do, and I'm asking that it would happen. That's the reason I'm getting down on my knees to pray. There's another reason that Paul prays, though. It isn't quite as explicit as the first, but it's right there in the phrase still, right? Because he says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. The Father, okay? Part of the reason that Paul prays is because he knows who God is, that God is his f Father. Uh, talking to, to, to Dad, asking Dad for something, that's a little bit different than asking a supreme potentate for something, Right? Like, you'd, you'd come differently into the room in those two situations. There's this, this intimacy, this, this trust, this, this confidence in the relationship that exists if God is Father. I heard one pastor say, it always struck me, I, I think it's interesting and true, if you want to learn how to pray, don't focus on prayer. Focus on God as Father, and you will start to understand prayer. Right? I mean, and that's the idea here. Even just watch kids as they interact with a good dad. Right? I mean, and see what that looks like. See the, the boldness, the familiarity, again, the intimacy, the, the trust, even the constant conversation. I have small children, right? And, and part of their conversation with dad is the fact that it's never ending. Anything that pops into their head, dad gets to hear about. This is what God longs for us, too, right? We're supposed to pray without ceasing, Paul says in another spot. Just, it's like you call, you put it on speakerphone, and you never hang up all day long, right? I mean, that's part of what this is. So understanding all this, should, it should change the way we pray. It would take away pretense. It would take away fear. It would take away masks. It would take away uh, fancy language or something like you're trying to impress God. No, you're just going, I just want to talk to my dad. Here's the way Mark Driscoll put it. He said, if we understand that God is dad, then we will naturally speak to him anytime about anything because we know we're loved, cared for, and safe with him. 
right? And that's, that's kind of what Paul's saying. Here's part of the reason I praise, because God is Father. I'm a, I'm a member of his family. We just hit that at the end of Ephesians 2. So I know he rules wisely. I know he gives graciously. I know he loves dearly. That's going to change how I pray. So there are some reasons that would matter to God. Praying in line, really, with, with God's purposes and his person. Those are reasons that matter to God. Praying in line with his purposes and his person. Next, let's uh, look at what it means to pray for requests that matter to God. And look at uh, verses 16 to 19. Now, Paul makes two requests in that section, so we're going to look at each one in turn. So let's look at the first one from 16 to the first half of 17. Let me read it for you. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So the first request that Paul makes here is a request for power, power at its core, right? And it's not the only time that power is going to come up. It's going to come up a few times in our passage this morning. It's a major theme. It's a major theme throughout Ephesians. In fact, it's not the first time it's come up in our letter either, right? If you've been with us from the, uh, the whole of this series in Ephesians, you'll, you'll remember this. The, the first prayer we looked at, in fact, from Ephesians 1, uh, verses 19 and 20, especially, Paul's praying the same thing, right? I want you to understand his incomparably great power for us who believe. So there's another prayer for power, for at least understanding the power that we have. That was the whole hooking up the sprinklers idea, right? Making sure that what's available to us, we're actually tapping into. So we've got to understand the power that's available to us, Paul says, but then it, it's almost like he takes this long excursus, right? Like he's saying, you've got to understand God's plan. And, and it specifically got to understand how the church functions in God's plan. And then I can finally explain to you why I want you to understand the power that's available to you. And so now he's, he's finally there. We've done that. We've walked through God's plan. We see what he's doing, building up this holy temple in which he'll dwell by his spirit. So now we can understand why he wants us to, to have this power. We, we, we know what the power is for. And it's, it's to reach spiritual maturity. To reach spiritual maturity. To be this holy temple in the Lord. I don't know about you. I know about me, though, for sure. And I can get really discouraged with lingering sin in my life. I mean, nobody else has had this experience, I'm sure, but that's fine. Right? Where you find that you are um, confessing the same sin more than once a week, more than once a day, sometimes. Sometimes as you're confessing sin, you're still committing it even, right? You, you recognize the bitterness is still there or something like that. And so the discouragement comes where it's like, am I ever going to be different? Right? I mean, am I ever going to actually change? I'll just give you one example from my life. It feels like I've been seeking change for a long time in this area. I'm not a, an overly positive person when it comes to my words. I'm not effusive with my praise, not by any means, right? Not, not affirming. Uh, and I wish I were. Like, I know people who speak like that. I know people who, who give life with the words they speak. And I, I want to be that kind of person. I want God to do that in me. But I've been asking for a while now, and it hasn't happened yet. And so you, you start to get discouraged, right? What confidence do I have that God can actually transform me? And that's what Paul's talking about here, right? Here it is. We're saying, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. Paul's saying, look, he's got stores of glory you can't even imagine. Yes, he's got the power to transform you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so Paul prays then that God would strengthen us through the Spirit in our inner being. Okay, both of those phrases, important. Inner being, meaning the core of who we are. It's the eternal part of us. The outer being, that's the part that's going to get weaker and weaker as time goes on. But the inner being, that should get stronger and stronger as we're being fit for heaven, right? That's the, the heart, the will, the mind, all of that. So in our inner being, and then that happens through this Spirit. It happens through the Spirit, as the Spirit is working in us. What happens when the Spirit fills us? Let's look at another letter of Paul's. This is Romans uh, chapter 8. It'll be up on the screen for you. Uh, this is verses uh, 10 and 11 and verse 13, where Paul just talks about, here's what this looks like when the Spirit is active in your life. He says this, But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death, that's the outer being, right? Wasting away. Even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life 
to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. Ultimately, even the outer part of us gets resurrected, right? We get raised to new life. And then here's the key phrase, verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So what does it look like when the Spirit's working in our lives? When the Spirit fills us, we, we become more righteous, right? We become more like Jesus. Our character matches his more and more from the inside out. The Spirit gives life as we kill sin. It's basically how this works. So why? What, what's the point of all of this? All of this is, again, the start of verse 17, so that... Here's why we're doing it, right? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And at this point, you go, hang on, hang on, hang on. Wait, I thought Jesus already dwells within me, right? Don't I get the spirit at conversion, that moment when I first trust in Christ, his finished work on the cross? Isn't that when, when the spirit indwells me? Yes, Yes, absolutely. We're talking about something a little different here, right? We're, we're talking about uh, the continual indwelling, the change that happens. Let's look at it like this. Um, that moment of conversion is a little bit like when you, you hand the deed over to Christ. You go, this was my house, okay, but now it's going to be your home. You live here. You're in charge of this place. So that's conversion. He moves in at that point. Now, any of you who ever moved into a new place, you know what happens when you move in. You develop a list, Right? Carpet's got to go. We need new fixtures. Like some of this is a little 1960s. We'd like to at least get it up into the 80s or something like that. And so you start to figure out, here's what's going to happen next. We're going we're to tackle these projects little by little as we can. And that's sort of what Christ does with us too. Moves in and goes, this place is great. It's in need of some work. It's actually in need of quite a bit of work, in my case at least. And so uh, I've got a long list of things, and we're going to start to take care of these one by one by one. So that's what we're looking at is Christ dwells in our heart. He, he's not just moving in, but he's slowly actually making my heart his home, making it his own as he changes. And this happens, Paul says, through faith, through faith, that continual trust, that continual handing over the deed and saying, yes, no, that this is your place. Okay, I might have picked a different color for the wood floors, but I trust you because you're God. I am not God. You're probably right here. Okay, that's, that's faith. That's the trust that comes in. And as you do that, as you believe in him, as, you, as you, you trust the work that he's doing, he's able to redecorate more and more. Again, make the house more and more his own. Now, all of this then leads to the second request. So let me read the second request now. Second half of 17 through 19. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So he's saying, okay, now that you're rooted, now that you're established in love, he's got two metaphors in a row right there, right? And they're both talking about, okay, love is the ground, okay? God's love for you is the ground in which this happens. It's the, the soil in which the seed of faith grows, or it's the foundation upon which this mature structure is built. Now that you're rooted and established in love, what do you still need? What do you still need? More power, right? His second request is very similar to the first one, right? We got power finally so that this happens, and now you need power, Okay, just even more power. It's a specific word that's used, this word that's used for power. It means the ability to obtain an objective. The ability to obtain an objective, to, to grasp something, really to get your, uh, your mind around a subject almost. Like this would be the prayer you would pray when you're trying to tackle calculus or something like that, right? Like I am not going to get this. So I need the ability to, to grasp this, this subject. So what is it that we're going to have a hard time understanding unless God gives us power? What is it that's so hard to know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ? Which is kind of a strange one, because you go, no, that's the easy part. Like, the Trinity is hard to understand, but God's love, that, that one I get, right? And Paul's going, I'm not so sure. Right? Let's, let's back up and make sure we've got this. It's kind of interesting, too, because as long as we're talking about identity and praying uh, our identity and whatnot, this is a prayer that we would know our identity, 
right? And that's what he's saying. A, a huge part of our praying identity is praying that we would actually understand who we are in Christ. How wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ for us? So what is this? Why is this so hard to know? Of course, this is more than just intellectual knowledge, right? It's not less than intellectual knowledge, but it certainly is more than that. This is more than just going, okay, God loves me. think I got it, right? This is something else. This is, this is experiential knowledge. This is this knowledge actually penetrating to the core of who we are. Let me give you this example. So here's a picture, hopefully, um, of, of a lovely beach. This is Tyrona National Park in Colombia. Okay, I've been here once. It's, it's, it's that lovely and more, believe me. Okay, so uh, there it is. It's on the Atlantic coast, kind of in the north of Colombia. You've got intellectual knowledge about Tyrona National Park now. Wouldn't you rather have experiential knowledge? I mean, it's February in Chicago, right? We'd like to experience what this is like. That's, and that's what Paul's saying, right? You gotta, you gotta know this love that surpasses knowledge, which, which I love. I was a, an English literature major, so grammar gets me giddy, right? This is what's known as, as paradox, right? How can I know something that's beyond knowledge, which is exactly what Paul's praying here. Well, what's he saying? He's saying you're never going to know it completely, exhaustively, right? But you can know it truly and adequately, and, and, and you want to pursue that. You want to know more and more about it. See, I don't think we're ever going to have absolute knowledge, exhaustive knowledge of the glory of God and the depths of his love for us, not even in glory, okay? I think we're going to spend eternity going, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I never caught that before either. It's just going to be infinitely increasing as years, millennia, millions of years go by, right? I think that's what's going to happen. Uh, and so that's, that's what he's saying. Uh, think of it like this. I've lived in Chicago my, my whole life. Uh, you know, we were in Columbia again for a few years and away at college, but I've, I've had a number of decades here at this point. I don't know the first thing about Chicago, right? I mean, there are so many cool things in Chicago that I have never experienced. I probably don't even know they exist, Right? Restaurants that I haven't been to, museums that I haven't been to, you know, th those places that only the locals know, and I'm a local and I still don't know them, like those kinds of things. How long would it take me to know Chicago exhaustively? More time than I've got, that's for sure, right? Well, how much more so with God, right? How much more so with God? And so that, that's what Paul's saying is, uh, if that's the case, don't you want to take trips more often, <laughs> like start to explore the neighborhood a bit more, get to know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God for you in Christ. Now, knowledge like this will, it will rush upon you at sudden moments, okay? So you, can, you can't plan this in some ways, where you, where you go, I'm going to have a, a deeper experiential knowledge of God's love. It, it comes upon you suddenly because it is a work of the Spirit. I remember hearing a story of um, Charles Hodge, one of the great theologians that this country's produced, uh, one of the most brilliant defenders, especially of the, the authority of the word of God at a time when it was being questioned. But he's a theologian, right? Good on intellectual knowledge. They're not famous for being real good on experiential knowledge, but Hodge was a, truly a man of God. He'd been studying God's word for years and years and years, right? Decades upon decades. He's there to teach his class uh, one day, and this was back in the time when uh, classes would open with a, with a hymn. And so they're singing, O four a thousand tongues, Right, and Hodge is singing, and he got to the line, his blood can make the phallus clean, his blood availed for me. And Hodge broke down and wept right there in front of his students, which is not what you want to do as a professor, right? But couldn't help it. H had, he, had he sung that phrase before? Of course. Had he known? He's taught people what it means that Christ's blood can make them clean. And yet at that moment, it became even more real to him, and he broke down and wept. I've had experiences like this myself, right? Same sort of thing, where I was in a room filled with many more people than I would have cared to have witnessed that, right? But it was, it was a Father's Day, I remember very clearly, and the pastor had decided to put uh, some scriptures up on the screen just to kind of say, maybe your dad wasn't uh, the best dad, and so it may confuse what it, your knowledge of what it means that, that God is Father. So he just put up some scriptures, scriptures I had read before, and one of them was Jeremiah 31, verse 3. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Something happened. No idea what, right? But something happened. I broke down and wept. I mean, wet like it was awkward for me and for people around me, okay? Like that kind of weeping. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know where it came from. 
right? But all of a sudden, my, and my experiential knowledge of God's love went deeper at that point. Look, I, I can't give you three steps in how to get there. I wish I could. I wish I knew the three steps because I would like to do this more often. It, it, it takes a sustained reflection on God as Father. It means time in his word. It means time in prayer, pursuing intimacy with him so that you can grow in this experiential knowledge and it will come. But as I, as I look at all this, what amazes me most of all is this, that as Paul's thinking about what it means that we become mature in Christ, he prays not that we would love God more, but that we would understand more how much God loves us. It just feels backwards to me, but it, it, it's so obviously true, right? Because our spiritual development will be hindered otherwise. Children who don't know how much their father loves them suffer. They suffer arrested development, right? And we had um, a family, good friends of ours that were down in Columbia. They've been missionaries in Aruba. That doesn't count, right? Like, you've got your reward in full if you're a missionary in Aruba. Okay, so they're missionaries in Aruba, but then in Venezuela, Brazil, and Colombia as well. We knew them, of course, when they were in Colombia. When they'd been in Brazil, they had adopted uh, a little boy who had some, um, some special needs, right? And so he was a little bit older when they adopted him. He was, he was two years old at that point. Um, so they you know, took him home and everything, and he's, he's, he's there, and, and you know, parent of a new child, right? So mom's peeking in as he's sleeping and things like that. I'm just so excited to have him. Noticed early on that he had an ear infection that was so bad that the pus was dripping out of his ear and he hadn't made a noise. Brielle had a double ear infection this week. She made noise, right? Like we knew that something was off because of what was going on, but not, not Zach because he had learned in his years in the orphanage that when you cry, no one comes, Right? It hindered his development. So, I mean, of course, the mom did the only thing you could do, right? She, I think she invented the Moby Wrap at that point. I don't think they had them back then, but she did something where she just strapped this kid to her chest, basically. So I'm not putting you down until you understand how much I love you. And that's what Paul's praying for us here. Because this goes badly. I worked with girl after girl after girl in Colombia. Um, where the families down there are even more fractured than they are here in the States, although we're catching up quickly, of course. Uh, but so a lot of dads who had left just abandoned family and marry somebody younger or something like that. So all these girls are going, I'm not sure if dad does love me. And in every case, they were looking for some cheap imitation. Right? If I don't know dad loves me, then I better find somebody who loves me. That led to immodesty, led to uh, promiscuity, it, all these sorts of things that you would expect. Right? That's what we're talking about. The, the, the spiritual development hindered in the same way that relational development is hindered. Because this is exactly the same in the spiritual realm. If we don't understand who God is and how much he loves us, we will seek cheap imitations. That's what idolatry is, Right? And so this is our, our whole life in a nutshell, going, I'm not sure God loves me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this instead. Uh, you're chasing success, you're chasing achievement, you're chasing recognition. Why? Because you want to know that you, you matter, right? There's something significant about you, but, but, but if you knew how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is, what would that, that do? It, it would assure you that you matter already. I mean, you mattered enough that God sent his son to die in your place. There's your significance. Are you chasing security, comfort, right? Something like that. Why? Because you want to know that everything's going to be okay, which is not a guarantee, of course, but that's, that's your, your life's pursuit is to try and get that feeling. But if you understood how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is, you would know that everything is going to be okay because it's in your Father's hands. Are you chasing uh, luxury, self-indulgence? That doesn't happen in Elmhurst, I know, but just imagine for a moment that it was something like, why? Because you want... Comfort, pleasure, right? You want to you enjoy life to the fullest. But if you understood how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is, you would know that this love is better than life, right? That there is pleasure here beyond what the world could ever offer. Psalmist puts it, Psalm 16, verse 11, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore, eternal, unending joy, full satisfaction. You chasing intimacy, illicit sex, dating the wrong person when you know it, if I could just get married, then, then my life would have meaning, something like that. Why? Because you want to know that you are lovable. Lovable, right? But if you understood how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is, you would know, forget lovable, you are loved. Loved perfectly already. You, you do away with the cheap imitations, right? 
Now, there might be some here this morning who are unconvinced, right? I mean, you may be here this morning and you're questioning Christianity still. Uh, don't necessarily believe that it's true. We're glad you're here with us and, and asking these questions um, in this community for sure. But, I mean, think of this. If you're unconvinced that God exists, what could be less important than understanding the love of a non-existent deity? Right? So for me to say this is the most important thing would sound awfully uh, foolish. Let me let's just speak a, a brief word to you specifically. First of all, I can't deal with the intellectual objections right now. Right? There are reasons you don't believe in God. I can't talk about it. I couldn't do him justice in the time that we have here. We would be here till dinner. Um, go on our website. I preached a series a few months back called Six Reasons Christianity Can't Be True. And we looked at some of the objections. Send me an email. I'll be happy to sit down and talk with you. This would be great. But for now, just, just grant me this hypothetical. This is where you are this morning. If God exists, okay, if God exists, and that God is the God of the Bible, then this is the most important information that you could possibly know, right? I mean, just without question, if the gospel is true, if it is true that God made us to be in fellowship with him, but we stubbornly, rebelliously went our own way, decided we would make better gods than he, and so sinned, right? But then that God loved us enough not just to say, sorry, stubborn rebels, you get destroyed. That's how the stories can go. But no, loved us enough that he sent his son to take our place, right? So he lived the perfect life we should have lived and then died the death that we deserve to die. So my death becomes his and his life becomes mine. That's this beautiful exchange that takes place, right? If we'll put our faith in him. In, in other words, if God loves us too much to let us commit eternal spiritual suicide, then that's the most important information that anyone could ever know, right? I mean, nothing gets more important than that. And here's the thing. It's what we all long for anyway. Intellectual objections or not, this is our heart's desire to be fully known and yet fully loved, that's the deepest longing of our heart. So you may be here this morning, whether you're questioning Christianity or not, drowning in a sea of shame, regret, guilt, fear, I don't know. It's trapped by the thought, if God knew me, I mean, if he really knew, if he knew what I had done, he would never Accept me. And Paul's just screaming in this passage, no, no, God loves you. And it's for you especially that Paul is praying, that I'm praying, that we as a church would pray, that you would grasp this, that your minds would get around this, that your hearts would get around this. That this would be the moment then. If this is you and there's something stirring in your heart right now, this is that time to to take the deed and say, okay, okay. I'm going to roll the dice here. I'm going to say, yes, I trust you. I don't want the cheap imitations anymore. I want you to come and make my heart your home. Paul prays all this then, that uh, at the end of verse 19, that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Again, he's making us into this temple, right? And what does that mean? If it's going to be a holy temple, it means he's going to have to polish some of the bricks, we spend a lot of time on some of the bricks, right? We're going to become holy bit by bit by bit as God works in us. That's chapters 4 to 6. That's where we're going the next few weeks, right? He's going to talk about what this holiness looks like as God works it out. But, but now we're starting to pray for requests that matter to God, right? We're not praying for our uncles, neighbors, moms, cousins, cats, hangnail any longer, right? We're, we're getting to the heart of what we need most. Lastly, uh, and again just briefly, let's look at what it means to pray for results that matter to God. The last two verses of chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him who is able. You want a, a, maybe a, a more woodenly literal translate, translation? It would be to him who is powerful enough. To him who is powerful enough, which seems really important given our request, right? What if God can't provide the power that we need, that we've been asking for? Well, that's just not the case. He is the powerful one, right? In fact, he's powerful enough to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. 
That seems like really helpful information too because look, what Paul asked for in verse 19 is crazy. To be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God? But God can do it. And God can do that and so much more, in fact. More than you can even dream, Paul is saying. Which seems to raise the question, are, are we asking big enough? Are our requests big enough, given how big God is? Now, don't get me wrong here, because we're talking about praying for requests that matter to God. This isn't, well, I was praying for a $10,000 raise. Maybe I should ask for a $20,000 raise. That's not a request that matters to God. No, what is it that God wants to do? He wants to make us like Jesus. Are you settling for freedom from one sin when he wants to make you into the exact image of his son? Are you praying for a few converts when the fields are ripe for harvest? Are you praying that God would change your circumstances instead of praying that God would change you through your circumstances? Those are the big requests. Do we ask for things so big, so grand, that we know that they couldn't possibly happen unless God does them? Right? That's what we're looking for. Is that will happen according to his power? His power alone, right? You ask for something like that, and you're going, well, this is not going to come from my ingenuity, right? Not going to be my hard work, my, my know-how, my plans, or anything like that, which, by the way, would then mean that the most important thing that I could do would be to pray, to get down on my knees before the Father and plead for these sorts of things. Now, what happens then if we're asking for things that are so big that only God could do them? and we have surrendered to him in prayer and pleading for this, well, who's going to get the glory when it comes true then? Ain't going to be you. It's going to be God. I mean, what do we want for this powerful one who does so much more than we can ask or imagine? We want glory. We want people to esteem him as highly as he should be esteemed, to value, value him above all. Our prayer should always result in the magnification of God where people look and go, that God is a glorious God. Another way to put this would be to say that his top priority should be our top priority. And what is God's top priority? Let's go back to the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, first thing he asked for, hallowed be your name. The first thing Jesus teaches us to pray is that people would understand how holy God is, how awesome. God is, how glorious God is. That should be our top priority in prayer, too. It's why we at least used to pray things like, for Christ's sake, for the sake of your name, shows up throughout Scripture as well. So we're asking for something that, that, that we know is going to redound to His glory. I mean, think, look, you're praying uh, that God would change you, right? That lingering sin that you're struggling with, that that be taken care of? Nobody's going to think for a moment that that's because of you that that happened. So when that finally happens, you finally get your anger under control. You finally start speaking words of affirmation. You, you put away the addiction. Nobody's going to go, good job, man. You did awesome there. They're going to go, I don't know what happened. But wh wh whatever happened to you, you're going to see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's the way Jesus put it. May this glory be his, not just here today, but throughout all generations. In the church, because we're the display of his glory. Right? We're the ones that he's changing and through us, changing others, reaching others in the church and in Christ Jesus because all the blessings come to the church through Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's prayer for what matters most. God's reasons, God's requests, God's results. Let's pray. Lord, we want to pray as Paul prayed. So we come to you, kneel before you as Father, speak to you as our Dad, and pray that out of your glorious riches, you would strengthen us with power through your Spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell more completely, more fully in our hearts through faith. We pray that as you root and establish us in love, that we would have power together as a church to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. To know this love that we will never know completely, but we can know truly and increasingly so that ultimately we may be filled to the measure of all your fullness, Lord. 
to be made like Christ. We pray this not for our sake, Lord, but for your sake, that to you, the one who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine would be glory in us, in this church, in Christ, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.